right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by John Lafave, who is on an island in British Columbia near Vancouver. How are you doing, John? I'm having a great day, John. Thanks so much for having me here. It's a great pleasure and indeed it's an honor. Thanks. Absolutely. And and John uh, has two books. One's called All's Well, Where Where Thou Art Earth and Why, and the second one, Good With Money. And uh, and John, um, just um, just to set the scene before we dive into our subject today, which is, you know, your history of entrepreneurial success, what you learned, uh, and what you learned from that about principles on which America may successfully move forward. So, you know, we we picked a very easy subject. You know, nothing nothing majorly earth shattering about something like how America can successfully move forward. So as you said before we came on, audacious topic. So I'm really looking forward to, to talking about that. But before we start, maybe just give a little bit of a brief background about where you come from and where you learned all the lessons that uh, you want to share with us today from. Well, John, I, I, I started out, um, you know, young, I, I, you know, in 1969, I was 17. <laughs> and you know, that, that was a different time. Um, sure. I was arrested for selling, you know, acid to cops that were dressed up like hippies and I wound up, you know, <laughs> doing eight months or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, but it wasn't, and that turned out to be an instructive experience for me because later on in life, I was a little bit more prepared for what was coming uh, <laughs> because of that. But um, eventually when I was around, you know, in my mid twenties, I went to university and I uh, began to practice law. Um, I was not really, honestly, not to say anything about the profession, but I, I um, I was uh, uh, a, a bit underwhelmed at the joys that came to me from practicing law, uh, but you know I'll say this: the education is superb, and one of the one, one of the um, the most important things about the learn, learning learning law is uh, you know that as as you know, uh, what what do they say? Um, it's a poor lawyer who stops when he gets the answer that suits him. <laughs> right, because you know the other guy is looking for the one that doesn't suit you, and you'd better know what that one is too. So it's a really good education in looking at things from the other guy's point of view, and that uh, it, we'll, we'll we'll see that how that has uh, served me, you know, in other ways that are not necessarily related to the legal profession. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in the practice of law, I met a fellow, Steve Lawrence, who was a, um, an entrepreneurial spirit of um, the highest order. And uh, he um, recognized that this is in about 1997, 98, 99. Right. And uh, the, internet, the internet was just taking off. And uh, in the early days of the internet, one of the most successful things on the internet was online gaming. The other one was, um, you know, looking at dirty pictures, of course. <laughs> but, um, and uh, Steve quite, uh, quite properly uh, it, it intuited that um, if somebody brought some professionalism, reliability, responsibility to the online money transfer side of the online gaming, that would maybe make a good little business model. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And we started a company uh, that I, I, I came up with the name is called NetTeller. Get it? NetTeller? Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, you know, we started that in about 2000. And um, very quickly, we were uh, transferring hundreds of millions of dollars, but largely between American gamblers and, and, and what we called offshore gaming sites. Uh, right. We went uh, public on the London Stock Exchange in 2003, uh, achieved the market cap around $2 billion. And um, which is, you know, that's quite, quite, a, quite a big hairball to choke yeah, down. Yeah, exactly, then, not to be sneezed at. And then around 2000, beginning of 2007, Uncle Sam put up his hand and said, wait a minute. And we were arrested and, um, uh, charged with, uh, well, they threatened three offenses, uh, uh, cons conspiracy, racketeering, and money laundering, 20 years each. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, after about a, uh, eight, eight months or so of negotiation, I wound up pleading guilty to a lesser offense, promotion of illegal gambling. Uh, and uh, my that, that morning in Malibu, when they knocked on the door and said, you must come to the door immediately, <laughs> uh, you know, my stock value dropped about, you know, $220 million. <laughs> and, you know, it was a, it was a rude awakening, you know, and I, um, but and then, um, you know, over, over the period of uh, about six years, we uh, negotiated a, 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 negotiated and completed a plea bargain 
myself, my partner, and my corporation between the three of us forfeited a quarter of a billion dollars to uh, to uh, uh, America. And uh, at the time, I made the sort of cynical calculation that with them building, burning a billion and a half a day and in uh, Iraq, you know, it was a billion and a half a week in in Iraq. I, I, I calculated that our forfeiture would take us to about you know four a.m. Monday morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there, there's a start for you, John. Where would you? Yeah, think? yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, it's fantastic. Uh, okay, so so I mean, an amazing like series of events, um, and obviously. Uh, but when you came out the other end of that, you know, we'd done the plea bargain and you were ready to to start again uh, or to move on um, from there. What, what, were, what was what was initially what was the biggest initial lesson that you learned from that experience? Well, I was kind of, I was well as, as well prepared as a, as a as a fellow can be, I think, to um, have that kind of wealth fall in their lap. I'd, I'd been, you know, as I said before we got on the air, I, you know, my. Mm. My profession in 1969 uh, wound me up in Dutch with the cops as well, but it had to do mm. with hallucinogenic drugs and mm. cops dressed up like hippies and that kind of thing. Um, but um, I was quite clear that uh, have, fall, coming into quite a bit of money um, did not make me special. You know, it was not, you know, if there's anything that made me special, that wasn't it. If anything, John, I was just ridiculously fortunate. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at one point there, we measured my net worth at around you know a third of a, a third of a billion dollars, really, and then, right. um, um, and you know, I knew from the beginning that uh, a it was to be enjoyed, but b it also came with very dire responsibility. And um, I spent quite a time think quite a bit of my career since then thinking about what that means. The responsibilities of wealth they're very similar in my mind to the responsibilities of freedom. And mm. my, my concept about um, freedom is that, you know, the price of freedom must be paid every day. We were told when we were kids that the price of freedom is the highest price, you know, and they meant what they meant was giving up your life fighting for freedom. And then if that's all it were, then, you know, about, you know, a, a, a thousandth of 1% of us give that price mm. and the rest of us get it for free. But mm -hmm. Um, actually, I think the price of freedom is that we have a duty every day that we enjoy freedom to strive as hard as we can to extend that freedom to all others who are less fortunate in the freedom department. And I think it, and freedom and wealth are very, very similar in that respect. I think wealth is something that, you know, um, if, if, if it's hoarded, it's not good money. But if you don't hoard it and share it responsibly um, to some degree, um, then you've earned it and it is good money and you can be proud of it. And those of us who want to can go ahead with that hobby and make and keep as much as they want, as long as they pay their fair share. Yeah, no, I agree. So, so uh, when you talk about um, learning some principles that you think can help America be more successful moving forward, what, what are some of those principles? I mean, obviously you've just outlined one there where the, the concept yeah. of freedom, and I, and I agree with you because I think, uh, freedom bestows a huge responsibility on people because when you live in a when you when if you're able to live um comfortably if you're able to do pretty much whatever it, whatever you want to do i mean there isn't there is an absolute obligation there for you to try and make the world a better place like use your freedom to do good and that doesn't mean that you have to devote your whole life to it but even in simple things within your your community, within your sphere of uh, of relationships, I mean, there are lots of things you can do to hmm. to give back. Generosity is a big part of it for me. Um, you know, I think that all of those things that we take for granted in our lives, you know, the privileged people of North America, and particularly the most privileged of us, we take for granted, you know, that we'll have we'll always have security and we'll have respect, and we take it for granted that we'll have access to food, clothing, and shelter. And we also take it for granted, and we don't really think about this part as much, though, but that we'll have access to the tools of self-improvement, education, to, you know, the tools of health, health care, uh, and, 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 and the things that we don't really, you know, focus upon as much are access to justice and access to basic finance. And finally, um, access to a healthy environment. And we all take those things more or less for granted. And, you know, what, and I, I like, I, I've come to think of them as sort of universal rights. And it's mm -hmm. not, um, it's kind of, um, you know, I try to figure out how to distinguish myself from all others. And why do I get these and, and others do not? 
and I can't find, I've, I've, I've yet to come upon, you, can, you might want to help me with this or some of your listeners might, but I've tried to come up with a, a, a um, you know, uh, a credible basis to distinguish myself from all others who don't enjoy all, all of those things. And I don't think there is one. I think that those things are the basic elements of freedom. And I think everybody, and I mean, everybody is entitled to them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and when you said gen when you said generosity for a moment, just uh, John, you said you yeah. mentioned generosity, and I think people often confuse generosity with just money, right? They think you know a generous person, you know, who dishes out money, but there are so many more things that you can be generous with, with your time, with your knowledge, with your insight. I mean, there's so many ways of being generous, but I think somehow a lot of people just um, think that gen that generosity sure. is like very one dimensional. That's pretty common to the way to, for us to look at all of the things in our life, in our culture nowadays. But John, to, to me, the most important thing that we can be generous with is our attention. When people give, when people, you, what you're giving me right now is the most valuable thing in my life, right? And, would, and, I, and, I, and I, I appreciate it very, very profoundly. But, um, you know, the, the kind of attention that we get from people, I think, is the best kind of attention that we get from people isn't when we talk and talk and talk. The best kind of attention that we get from people is the, the uh, attention that we get from them when we pay attention to them, right? When we pay attention to them. So, yeah. but on American, on, you know, the principles in America, you know, that you, you ask about, you know, when America was founded, uh, everybody knew who Adam Smith was. And we've, we've come to know him in certain ways fairly well, all of us as well, Adam Smith, you know, the guy yeah. who came up with the idea of the invisible hand, um, mm -hmm. his book in the 1776, The Wealth of Nations speaks about that. But he mentioned it earlier than that, 16 years earlier in a book he called The, the, the Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in that book, um, you know, he says a couple of things that are very important. One of them is that, uh, uh, you know, people, he, quaintly, he called people men. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think he meant people. Um, are, are good, men are good. And uh, the best thing that we can do with them is set them free. And if we set them free, uh, if, we set, if we set people free, uh, they, they will do the best that can be done for everybody's uh, ultimate benefit. Um, and we, um, it's a very, very positive view of human nature, right? It's a super yeah. positive view of nature. In America now, we have a different view. We've come to a different view. We come to, and I, you know, I, I'm a Canadian, but our culture is very similar to yours. So mm -hmm. if you don't mind, yeah. I'm going to speak as if I'm one of you guys. Um, For sure. Hey, listen, I'm an interloper myself, so I'm okay. I'm okay yeah. with that. Right. <laughs> um, nowadays, we've come to a different view of human nature, and it's quite a bit more cynical. You know, if we give mm -hmm. a guy 400 bucks for COVID, we're going to turn him into a bum. You know, <laughs> you know, if you give anybody anything, they're just going to like get, want more and more and, you know, sit back and cross their legs and want to be taken care of for the rest of their life. That's not the view of human nature that America was founded upon. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is return to that originalist view of human nature. And that is that people are basically good. If you give money to people, like say basic annual income, sure, 10% of the people are going to be kind of bums about it. But 90% of people are going to take that and make something good, uh, good from it, make something to look after themselves. They're pride, they take pride in, them, in themselves and, and they will. And I think that, you know, that's a, a really important, um, you know, it's, it's a really important right. principle that we should turn to. I think that's the spirit that America was founded on. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind me saying, John, I hope your guests give me, have some mercy on me this too. That is the way that we can M-A-G-A. That's the way we can make America great again, is showing our faith in people to do well for themselves if we just give them a little push up the hill. Yeah, uh, and, and I think, though, um, it's, it's funny because, um, yeah, there's so many, there are so many contradictions today. There's so many, like, uh, um, you know, forces, like, running country to, to each other. Um, uh, and 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 I think particularly at the experience that we've all been through, it's almost gone a little bit in the in the opposite direction where it seems like people want to 
be like less freedom want to you know, sort of be more kind of restrictive and and tell people how they should live their lives regardless and this isn't a party this isn't a political issue this across oh. the spectrum we to what you have just outlined there about trusting in the inherent goodness of people and giving them the fr freedom to succeed just doesn't seem to be a concept that's shared across the political spectrum today no and it is a wonderful wonderful idea and it's what made America great from the beginning is that, mm -hmm. that positive spirit in human nature, that positive attitude about what, what, what we are all made of. And I encourage people to consider it as some, a place to, uh, you know, one, one of our historical values that we should, um, you know, if you wanna be conservative, let's go back to our original <laughs> spirit of, about human nature. How talk about conservative, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's about the only radical thing you can do anymore is, is, is go back to, you know, generosity of spirit. And that's what it is. It is generosity of spirit to take it for granted that people are going to do good. And sure, there's always going to be people who take advantage. And but that's, you know, and I'm going to say it's you pick the number. It might be 10 percent. It might be 20 percent. But it's not a good enough reason to forsake the 80 or 90 percent. Yeah, and but I, I think, and and then also that you know the concept of individualism and and everything. I mean, today is. Uh, I mean, I just feel like we're 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 not we're not celebrating the, the 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 individual spirit and the freedom of spirit what you're talking about and as you said i mean you just a definition of conservative you could say today as well liberals i mean they they need to redefine that term too because it's very illiberal uh uh and 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 i think the Absolutely. and i think and i think you're right as is i i think we've just and as i said regardless of where you are in the political spectrum we've gotten into this idea of where it's almost like a paternalistic society where we we have like a group of people who know what's best for you regardless as i said of where they sit on the political spectrum and we're overlooking as you said the foundation uh, of the country and all of that is where it was like trusting in people and people doing things and 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 being excited about doing things and people rising up you know raping not rising up but being raised up uh, because of it and and those all seem very counter cultural ideas today and as i said it's not even one color one side of the spectrum or the I, other it i just agree seems totally to it's con almost, counter to what all it's all it's all, john it's almost more endemic in liberal thought that i i know what's better for you than you know what's for you you know and i you know i've i'm i'm guilty you know i've always voted liberal in canada but i'm, mm -hmm. I'm also a, a very um I've never done anything in my life that was successful where I wasn't surrounded with some seriously conservative people. <laughs> and I, you know, I need that kind of influence in my life, you know, and it's just super important. But, you know, I think in the same way that, that um, uh, our, our impression uh, as a society of human spirit has um, turned sour, I, mm -hmm. I think the same thing has happened to conservatism and, and liberalism as well. But, you know, I, I, when I look carefully at uh, conservatism now, you know, um, most mostly what you hear from people is that uh you know conservatism means you know david brooks you know he says you know uh conservatism is like small government low taxes but to me though john those are dog whistles for no regulation and what's mine's mine yeah don't try to make me share it right but really i think that fundamentally conservatism is about the preservation of capital conserve capital right right and one of the most fundamental elements of capital sure money but one of the most fundamental elements of capital is property and you don't impair your property to to make money for operating right mm -hmm. right yeah our fundamental unit of property is earth mm -hmm. you don't impair the capital to make money for operating i'm going to say one other element of capital that's super important might be the most important, not money, not earth, human resources. Yes. Human resources are supremely important, fundamental element of capital. So yeah. we have to look after our money, preserve it and conserve it and make it grow. We have to look after our, our property, our planet, mm -hmm. conserve it, preserve it and make it grow. And we have to look after our people. People are geniuses. 20% of us are properly prepared to pull on the oars in this planet and 80% are not. And who knows how many of those 80% are geniuses, right? Yeah. We'll never find out if we don't give them a leg up. No, no, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it's um, it's funny you should mention that uh, because uh, um, 
I was I was uh, going through some of the the English that my son was who's sixteen was going through in school, and it was uh, that one of the pieces was uh, an essay from Alice Walker, uh, who oh, yes. wrote the color purple, etc. And it was in search of our mother's gardens, and it was written in the seventies, I think. But to your point, it was about. Um, the experience of of the generations of African American women in you know through slavery and all of that and how how many how many geniuses how many poets and singers and writers and painters and all of that were lost during that because of their circumstances, yeah. uh, and, but they still managed to hand it down. But I think the point is the similar to what you're making right now is how many how many people in the world are we losing geniuses for people, artists, people who could do fantastic things or even just small things in their community because we're not we're not supporting them. And that leads me to my maybe most important point, and that is this: if we develop that eighty percent, wealth is infinite. Mm -hmm. Wealth is infinite. The more people produce, the more productivity we have. There's two kinds of growth too. It's not just growth in sales, right? Yeah. It's growth in productivity. And when oh, we yeah. develop our human resources, we get growth in productivity. You know what I think? Making money and hoarding it, John, is the wet dream of wealth. Forgive me if there's anybody out there who's offended by that, but the, 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 you know, the, the, the thrill of it, the rush of it is very short term and it's for no good purpose, <laughs> right? And the only way you can do it is by, you know, kind of wanking it up again. But whereas the, the, the dividends of developing human resources, and I'm gonna say the dividends of generosity are infinite. And, they, and, and so we're not, you know, we're stepping on our own self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by, and, by and, not developing human resources. Yeah, and and just to, just to focus in on that for a moment, because I think that's a really incredibly important point that you're raising yeah. there. And I do think that the idea of an, uh, an abundant, the abundant mindset, unfortunately, isn't shared as widely as it should be. And we, and too many people view everything through the prism of finite. There's a finite pie, right? There's a finite amount. Therefore, if you, John, if you make a ton of money, somehow there's less money for me to make. If you do something, and, and I think yeah. that's what we have to change. And, and I think that's a pervasive mindset right now. This the opposite of the abundant mindset. It's like the competitive, it's a small pie. We've got all, but we got to get back to realizing, as you said, that there is abundance there and there is enough for everybody. It's, it's access is the issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and the, the beautiful thing is, you know, um, apart from generosity, um, having such wonderful dividends, you know, I run into people every week to remind me of things I did 10 years ago that I never, that I've totally forgotten about, but changed their life and they don't forget it. You know, if I lost everything today, John, I could get free peanut butter sandwiches for the rest of my life, no <laughs> problem, right? So, so and, and it's... Um, but yeah, the other, um, but the other thing is, and this is pretty obvious too, when you help people, they don't bust your balls. <laughs> they, don't, <laughs> they don't try to come and do you. You know what I mean? They come and try to help you. And that's, yeah. and that's the spirit that I think that will actually make America great again. Yeah. And by the way, just to, just to underline that is when you help people or you're generous with people. And again, the generosity can take, as you said, it's attention. Actually paying attention to people is, is the simplest place to start and one of the most powerful. However, not, not just will they you know, be generous back to you, but they'll go on and feel the obligation in many ways, the internal inherent obligation to go on and help other people. So it's, it perpetuates, perpetuates goodness. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it's a slippery slope, and it's one that I'm I can't wait for us to start going down. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, John, it'd be fantastic. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Fascinating, fascinating story. Um, before we go, um, all of John's information will be below this, uh, be below this uh, interview here, um, all the links, etc. But please do tell people a tiny bit more about what you're doing today. Well, I. Um, I'm, I'm mostly work, work, working on pitching, you know, this this scheme to, to folks. I've got my two books, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've I've recently just come to um, uh, one one of the things I did when I was uh, out on bail was I made uh, two double CDs with some of the greatest 
uh, the greatest uh, studio guys in the world and um, yeah. a great, great record producer, uh, Brian O'Hearn. And um, I've come into the, the present in a way, but half of those now just went up on, um, you know, the streaming services yesterday, uh, Spotify and Apple Music and whatnot. And then the other half will be up in a few weeks. So if you learn how to spell my name properly, you're going to be able to find all that recorded music online. <laughs> Um, and, you know, my, my main thing, though, is to try to encourage people, John, to, there's a guy on your show last week, uh, let's see, where is, uh, his name was Kevin Elko, and he was, he said this really wonderful thing about the skillful management of attention that was, that mm -hmm. I thought was uh, super important. He said, he said, 64% of production comes from 4% of our activities. Well, I have this thing that I think that's exactly uh, uh, apt to say about this miracle that we have that is consciousness and one of the things i like to encourage people to do is consider thoughts that in that barge in our in our minds as being uh clients that don't have an appointment or, or you know friend friends that don't have <laughs> you haven't been invited <laughs> you know and it's really really important for me to make this point the most wonderful things i've ever come up with are things that came up while i was like chopping wood or windsurfing or something like that you know, it's not when we're sharpening my pencil and trying really hard to come up with ideas. We have to let ourselves be free with a skillful management of attention for me includes leave our minds open for the things that pop up. Our internal genius is a lot smarter than we are. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I'm glad you. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that as well because I, I. One of the things I've talked to a lot of people about is, I think unfortunately we live in a culture today where people are afraid to be alone with their own thoughts. To be honest, like most people, if they had if they had to go out and chop wood now, would probably you know have Siri going so that they could have all their texts read out to them so they didn't sure. miss <laughs> anything for two seconds. And I think that's part of it is that people have to learn to be alone with their thoughts and to cut out all the distractions. I mean, not all the time, but at least some of the time you need that. Otherwise, as you said, you're never going to have, uh, you know, great breakthrough or creative thoughts if your mind is full of clutter and distraction. Right. And the most important part of it is to be available. Well, you will, I think you will have those genius thoughts. The most important thing is to be available for them when they come up. Exactly. We don't pinch a hold of them like a dream. They'll be gone just as quickly as a dream is gone. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, listen, John, this has been fascinating. Okay, Thank you so started. much. For, no, yeah, we could have gone on. We're going to part two. Okay, all right. Thanks <laughs> um, very much. Yeah. Um, listen, John, this has been great. Um, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.